Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, this talk on pain, the management of pain, pain and addiction with Dr. Herschler. So we'll wait just a few minutes to make sure everybody gets in. It's just about three. Let me know when you want me to get started. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, there are a couple people still coming in. So just a reminder, this is Zoom format. So if you have questions, um, you can either put them in the chat on the, the webinar platform and they'll be uh, moved over so we can see those, or you can actually unmute yourself and ask a direct question um, and whatever your preference is. If you're not speaking, uh, just please mute yourself. But we'll go ahead and, and get started. So Dr. Herschel is um, an addiction psychiatrist here in the Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry at Chestnut Ridge Center, and also works in our pain clinic with individuals with co-occurring pain and addiction, and works in um, our code clinic with individuals with opioid use disorder prescribing buprenorphine. So a lot of experience working with this population, and thank you, Dr. Herschel, for coming to speak with us about this today. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everybody. So I wanted to start out talking about you know, my training. I, I did my addiction psychiatry fellowship in 1997. And I did it at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And at that time, there wasn't much emphasis on pain in the management of patients with addictions. And then we had the opioid epidemic and people kind of woke up and realized how important this comorbidity is and and are really getting focused on how to address the co-occurrence of both pain and addiction. And so I'm gonna talk about the safe and effective management of those. So this is the uh, Center for Integrative Pain Management here at West Virginia University. And uh, I work there, uh, part of my, I wear several hats at WVU and part of my responsibilities is providing psychiatric care. And I work for the high-risk pain clinic at the high risk at the Center for Integrative Pain Management. And I'll talk more about what that involves exactly. And so uh, this center it uses a multimodal approach to pain. And so that means that we're not just using medications, but we have chiropractic and massage and acupuncture and movement therapy and a dietitian and psychotherapy and psychiatric care. And then we have injections and pain pumps and uh, other medications that are used. There's a lot of approaches, a multimodal approach to the management of pain. So today for my talk, I'm gonna cover uh, several core concepts. I'm gonna talk about some definitions, uh, the epidemiology of pain and addiction or the prevalence of those uh, disorders, uh, neuroscience behind pain and addiction, the psychosocial aspects, I'm gonna talk about the opioid crisis and you'll hear from Nora Volkow or Volkoff, I think is how she actually properly pronounces her name, who's the director of NIDA. Uh, I'm gonna talk about marijuana and CBD oil and its management in pain. I'm gonna talk about integrative pain management or kind of the gold standard of approach to pain. I'm gonna talk about buprenorphine or Suboxone uh, in the high-risk pain clinic, which is a way that we address uh, people with risk of addiction and uh, also severe pain. And then I'm going to talk about the self-management of pain. So uh, often patients don't know what to do for themselves in the management of pain. And there's actually a lot of knowledge that we have about how people can work to self-manage their pain and be active in their treatment, not just passive recipients of healthcare. And then I'm also going to talk about how patients can help themselves achieve and maintain abstinence. So patients can also be active in the management of addiction and not just passive recipients of, of addiction healthcare. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, the neuroscience behind recovery and kind of the modern view of pain recovery and addiction recovery and talk about why neuroplasticity is so important and competitive neuroplasticity and, how, and why recovery works. And then I'm gonna talk about some future directions and then I'll, I'll make some conclusions. And I, I wanna let you guys know, I welcome any, any questions or comments you have. 
during this talk and uh, or you can save things till the end, but let, let's just have a discussion here. So here's some definitions. I'm sorry for the wordy slide. Uh, pain is basically an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. And it, it is from the actual poten potential tissue damage. And uh, so it's a, a physical experience, but it's also an emotional experience. Now, addiction is really about brain reward and motivation and memory and dysfunction in the circuits that lead to biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. And the key element of addiction is this loss of control. That behavior gets out of control, the reward pathway is being affected, and, and, uh, and people lose control of the behavior. And that can lead to all kinds of problems associated with the addiction or consequences and they tend to go through cycles of relapse and remission. And uh, without engagement in recovery and treatment, it can result in disability and even premature death. So what about some definitions for pain? So acute pain is usually straightforward. This is the kind of pain where we know what the underlying condition is and the pain is treated and, and the condition is treated and the pain usually goes away as expected. But chronic pain is where pain persists. And so you're looking at pain for three to six months or longer. And in these cases, sometimes the illness or injury is already healed and pain persists anyway. Or sometimes there's no known cure for the disease and they're still having pain. And then the pain can fall into kind of different categories or types of pain or what's the quality of the pain. And so you can have somatic pain, which is lo well localized, it's attributable to specific structures and can be stabbing, aching, or throbbing. And then there can be visceral pain, like the pain associated with a surgery. After surgery, someone has adhesions or they were in a motor vehicle accident and they damaged their spleen. So visceral pain is poorly localized and dull and cramping. And then neuropathic pain is a dysfunction of the nervous system. And this kind of pain is sharp and shooting and burning, and it follows the, the, the transmission along the nerves or, or the dermatomes, we call it, or the way the nerves travel through the body. And then Cicely Saunders, who worked in a hospice setting, developed a concept called total pain. And she says that total pain is a suffering that comprises of a person's physical, psychological, social, emotional, spiritual, and practical struggles. And so what people really experience with pain is total pain. You know, that pain may be localized to a body part, but there's an emotional component and there may be things affected in their life and they may have other problems associated with what's happening in their lives. And so it's a total pain situation uh, that really is important, especially in addictions, because people are getting relief from their total pain with a medication like an opiate, and that really leads to out of control behavior. So Margot Margo McCaffrey says, pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is and exists wherever he or she says it does. So it, uh, the real definition of pain is the person's own personal experience of pain. So what about epidemiology? What's the prevalence of these problems? So substance use disorder hovers around 20 or 30% in the general population. Whereas uh, chronic pain is in about 20% of people uh, in the general population. So they're pretty close to similar occurrence. Strangely enough though, the United States is only 4.6% of the world's population, but consumes 99% of all hydrocodone and 81% of all oxycodone prescribed worldwide. So you can see how out of control that had gotten in 2017, that's when this was published. So it's a little bit dated, but it gives you a sense of how bad this problem really became in the United States. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that may have occurred, you know, what was our culture here that led to that problem. And I, I want you to hear from uh, Sean Mackey uh, from Stanford. I'm gonna show you a video about uh, epidemiology of pain and addiction.
This is Doug Brunk reporting from a psychopharmacology conference sponsored by the Nevada Psychiatric Association in Las Vegas. Comorbid chronic pain and substance abuse are thought to be highly prevalent, but researchers are trying to better understand the magnitude of the problem. Well, what we probably know is that the numbers that we have are uh, an underrepresentation and underreporting. We know that uh, based on the recent Institute of Medicine report on pain that about 116 million Americans suffer from pain in this country. And we've got some data that suggests that perhaps 10% or so of patients with chronic pain have a co-occurring addictive disorder. And so if you take now the flip side of that and you look at the numbers of patients who show up, the millions of patients that show up with a primary addictive disorder, you see actually a higher percentage of patients who have chronic pain. Typically about 30 to 60 percent of those will have chronic pain. So we believe that this is a real problem, this co-occurrence, and that these patients in particular tend to be extremely challenging to take care of. The data that we do have suggests that they cost 10 times more to care for than an average patient and more than three times more than a patient with chronic addiction. The one take home message is we need da better data to actually figure out uh, just how big this problem is to do something about it. First thing is to develop a solid differential diagnosis for your patient. Secondly is to identify any psychiatric comorbidities that may need to be addressed with that. Next, if you decide that you're going to prescribe opioids, make sure that you give appropriate informed consent and good education for the patients about what the expectations are for this trial. And I mentioned trial, uh, and I want to emphasize that because it should be made clear to the patient that there is no guarantee that this is going to be anything other than a short period of time to see if there's improvement. To then document and reassess and redocument the benefits of these medications. And uh, Steve Pasek, who is a psychiatrist out of uh, New York, now at Vanderbilt, came up with this idea of the four A's, which uh, suggests that doctors document their activities of daily living, the degree of analgesia that a patient gets, the uh, occurrence of any side effects or adverse effects, and then any aberrant behaviors. Document those four A's. Use that as a guide as to whether you should go up on the medications, hold steady, or come down. And then to use a number of risk mitigation strategies, including uh, your own state's uh, prescription monitoring programs, which I encourage everybody to avail themselves of, uh, appropriate urine drug testing and random screening for patients who are on uh, opioids, uh, and then also utilizing information sources such as uh, family uh, and spouses to assess are the patients really using these medications appropriately and are they really improving their overall physical functioning and quality of life. All right, so just, just some thoughts. So that recording was from 2012. And I liked what he said about the epidemiology, but that was a Stanford doctor who was talking about using opiates in people who have comorbid pain and, and addiction. And our thinking is really changing about whether that's appropriate to, with someone with a high risk of addiction if we want to be, you know, offering them opiate medications, uh, you know, traditional uh, mu opiate receptor agonist opiate medications uh, for, for pain. And so I'm going to talk more about what the thinking is now, at least here at WVU. All right, so let's talk about the neuroscience of addiction. So there's three stages in the neuroscience of addiction. You've got the binge intoxication stage. I guess you guys have probably heard plenty about this, but so that's in the basal ganglia or the nucleus accumbens where the reward center of the brain is. And then you have the withdrawal negative affect stage, which is in the extended amygdala. And then lastly, you have the preoccupation anticipation stage, which takes place in the prefrontal cortex. And so those three elements are the basic uh, stages of the addiction cycle. The neuroscience of pain is a little bit different. With pain, we have nociceptors or, or receptors on the end of nerve endings that, uh, it, that receive the pain signal and they travel down axons to the dorsal horn and the spinal cord and travel up the spinothalamic tract to the thalamus. And they affect our alertness or our, our level of, of alertness in the reticular activating system. 
and our emotions in the limbic system and our stress response in the autonomic nervous system and they're modulated by the periaqueductal gray. And then they go from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex uh, where the actual sensation, the physical sensation of pain is experienced. And so that's kind of the neuroscience of pain. And so here's the track, though this is a complicated uh, image here, but you, you can see the, the nerve fibers traveling to the spinal cord and tracks up to the brain. And so it's a, it's a really complicated system of fibers that travel up to the brain to cause pain sensation. And then also uh, there are certain neurotransmitters that are involved in the experience of suffering. And there's also neurotransmitters involved in pleasure, positive emotions. And so we're talking about with suffering, dynorphin and corticotropin releasing hormone and substance P and vasopressin. And dynorphin is actually a, a kappa opiate receptor agonist. It, it affects the kappa receptor, which is a suffering receptor uh, and opiate receptor in the brain. And then positive emotions are associated with dopamine and serotonin norepinephrine and gamma aminobutyric acid and glutamate and endorphins and uh, prolactin and anandamide and relaxin and oxytocin. So uh, lots of uh, neurotransmitters and hormones are involved in the pleasure experience. So next I'm gonna shift to uh, psychosocial aspects of pain and addiction. And so, in events in life like abuse or trauma can often be so un unbearable that they're not felt directly and can instead be expressed as physical pain. And part of what happens with that is that people may push down unacceptable feelings, especially like anger. And then they get something called somatization of pain where the suppressing the anger kind of results in an anxiety emotion and then a lot of physical discomfort or somatic symptoms. And Freud talked about the repression of painful memories transitioning into physical symptoms or conversion. So you've heard of like a conversion disorder. And then chronic pain can also mimic a parent's pain condition. So if somebody grows up with a parent who has a lot of pain, they may develop pain later in the life in an unconscious way, just kind of mimicking their parents' experience. And then in pain, we talk about pain catastrophizing and what that means is that when someone experiences pain, their harm alarm goes off and they think, oh, something terrible is happening to my body. And it can get very extreme. Like the person may, uh, you know, think the worst possible scenario when they're experiencing pain. But with chronic pain, a lot of times that injury is already healed and there's still some pain, but there's not really damage going on. And so uh, there has to be some challenging of this catastrophizing to get the pain experience under control psychologically. And then also pain is a form of communication. So once psychological mediators of pain are expressed, then the physical pain no longer becomes necessary. So if somebody is somatizing in anger and they're having the, the pain come out, if they can express the, the anger and, and, and let that out in, in a healthy way, then the pain can dissipate when someone's somatizing. So next I'm gonna talk about psychiatric disorders and pain. And uh, so depression, major depression is very common in pain patients. 25% uh, of chronic pain patients have major depression. And actually 60 to 100%, and I would lean more toward 100% of chronic pain patients have some depressive symptoms. And so this is a very common comorbid issue. And so the depression can be secondary to the pain itself. And if the depression is mild, then we call that an adjustment disorder. And if the pain has the five of nine neurovegetative signs of depression, uh, you know, then it becomes major depression. But depression does not cause pain. It does increase the sensitivity to pain and it predicts disability. And also when you treat depression, people don't notice pain as much. You know, if somebody's mood is more positive, they don't seem to be affected as much by pain. So it's important to address this psychiatric issue. And then anxiety occurs in 30% or more of patients with chronic pain. 
And so usually the common uh, diagnoses are generalized anxiety disorder, uh, you know, up to 20% or panic up to 11%. But you can also have uh, adjustment disorder, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, comorbid depression and substance use are very common in patients who have anxiety disorders along with pain. And often uh, the fear or worry about pain is what makes them feel nervous and they can have muscle tension or insomnia or irritability. And so even as much as 43% of patients can have an adjustment disorder reacting to the pain situation and just creating an anxiety related to their pain and will it go away and how severe is it gonna be and you know, worries about their pain. And then as I mentioned, suppressed anger is often associated with anxiety and can be also associated with somatic symptoms, including pain. And then one of the places where we see a lot of anxiety is in people with cancer and pain. And so the existential anxiety that people have with cancer uh, can be met with truth telling, uh, helping them accept the situation and connecting with their family, you know, and to treasure the time that they have. And then illness anxiety is when there are actually minimal somatic symptoms, but tremendous amounts of worry. And so sometimes you'll see a lot of illness anxiety uh, related to people who have some experiences with pain. And then post-traumatic stress disorder is also common in pain patients and addictions patients. And so seven to 39% of patients with chronic pain have post-traumatic stress disorder. And so they have to be exposed to an extreme traumatic stressor. And pain after the traumatic event is a risk factor for PTSD. So, uh, you know, patients who uh, are in a motor vehicle collision and, and have a lot of trauma and pain are more likely to slip into a, a PTSD picture than somebody who doesn't have a lot of pain associated with their injuries. And then in PTSD, there's three dimensions of symptoms. You've got re-experiencing like intrusive recollections and nightmares and cues of events uh, triggering recollections and avoidance where the person avoids people and places and things that remind them of the event. And then hyperarousal, like an exaggerated startle or hypervigilance. So those three categories of symptoms have to be present uh, to make a diagnosis of PTSD. And then personality disorders are also common in pain. And we, of course, know that in addictions as well. And so the key to personality disorders is differentiating states and traits. And so a state, like a manic state in somebody with bipolar disorder is a brief episode. It's a, it's a the period is just not that long lasting. Whereas a trait is something that's present over a long period of time. It's a consistent pattern of behavior, a way of thinking and, and, and behaving. And so personality disorders have traits. And so the prevalence of personality disorder in chronic pain patients ranges from 37% to 66%. And you've got the three clusters. The B cluster is the most commonly associated with pain and addiction. And so, uh, you know, I think addictions are more common in these patients uh, because they're more impulsive kind of personality disorders. And so I think that sets them up for having, and also maybe more emotional dysregulation. So it sets them up for uh, having uh, more temptation to use substances. So also malingering is a very big problem with pain and addiction. And so what malingering is, is when a patient feigns a complaint because of an external incentive. And so that could be money, a drug of some kind, uh, or avoidance of work. And so with people with addictions and, and uh, you know, that they may want to get an opiate or some other treatment of pain that's a habit forming. And so they may, you know, pretend to have pain or malinger their pain in order to get the drug. And so you see that commonly with these comorbid disorders. And so waste is a mnemonic to kind of identify these people. The, the W stands for withholding of information. The A is antisocial personality. So if they had conduct disorder as a child and criminal behavior, uh, adult antisocial behavior, then, then you're gonna recognize this is a person more likely to be someone who would be malingering their, their pain symptoms. 
And then also the somatic exam is inconclusive and changeable. So typically when somebody has a pain condition, their symptoms don't keep changing over the course of your evaluations of them. And so uh, it should be a consistent presentation. And also the treatment T is erratic with non-compliance and vagueness. And of course there are external incentives. And so one thing that's helpful if you suspect somebody of malingering is to look at old records or talk with providers who treated them in the past. And you're gonna hear a lot of the same stories and suspicions of malingering in the past. And then there's some physical exam findings called Waddell signs. And these can identify amplification of symptoms or sincerity of effort may not be there. And so, but this is not necessarily diagnostic. And so you have to be careful, you know, be deciding for sure that somebody uh, has mal a malingering situation going on just based on a physical exam. And then lastly, the prognosis is very guarded uh, for people who malinger. This is a behavior that tends to persist. Unfortunately, it's rewarded uh, by the, the system that we, our healthcare system. And so malingering can be a big problem. And next I wanna talk about suicidality. So uh, two to three times more prevalent in chronic pain patients in the general population. And the lifetime prevalence of suicide attempts uh, with those with chronic pain is about five to 14%. And uh, suicide thoughts in up to one in five people. And hopelessness is a key finding uh, in somebody who's suicidal. If somebody's expressing hopelessness, that's a big warning sign that they may act on their suicide thoughts. And you really need to get them to the right level of care. Uh, you know, of course, if they have a plan for suicide and they feel unsafe and they have uh, means to harm themselves, you know, all the risk factors you want to you want to keep in mind, but hopelessness is a real thing you should pay attention to. And then all chronic pain patients should be routinely evaluated for suicide thoughts. And so what I recommend saying is something like, do you ever feel so miserable that you have suicide thoughts? And you know, just a frank question to open that up for the patients to, to see if that's part of their story. And then patients will have a you know, frank discussion and it's a relief to them that to bring it up, you know, that the people sometimes feel that miserable. And then the thing that we really want to do with these patients is instill hope. And the most recent research about suicidality says that, uh, you know, it's actually a problem that the patient's having difficulty solving, that they come up with suicide as a way of solving the problem. And so if you can identify what the, the underlying problem is and work together with them on kind of healthy strategies to address this problem with a bit of stubborn hope, that can really help to resolve the suicide thoughts. So you, you just wanna keep that in mind that uh, what is the problem underlying this? And then what about anger and violence? So 88% of chronic pain patients report anger, uh, chronic anger in 38% of chronic pain patients, 8% in community patients. Um, efforts to suppress anger can cause pain and expressing anger can relieve pain. Uh, chronic pain is, more, is an important uh, mechanism of violence against physicians. And so, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that uh, you address whether the, the patient has a history of violence or violent ideation. And then chronic pain is associated with intimate partner aggression in 30% of chronic pain patients. So very common that uh, patients who have pain can be involved in domestic abuse. And so, like I said, the past is the best predictor of the future. So you definitely want to be aware of the, the history of violence in, in these patients and assess for that. And so what I ask the patients is, do you ever get so angry that you think of harming someone else? And you know, just a frank discussion about anger and, and is it getting out of control? And so there might be diagnoses like intermittent explosive disorder or adjustment disorder with disturbance of conduct. Uh, and sometimes it can just be antisocial personality that drives a lot of this anger behavior. So uh, you want to triage to the right level of care uh, with people with psych psychiatric symptoms and psychiatric problems and patients with addictions. And so I think of it like a traffic light. 
Uh, I know you've probably heard of the ASAM levels of care for addictions, but when you're thinking of psychiatry, it kind of helps to think of a traffic light. And so the red zone is crisis mode, where so you need a, an immediate solution. You got to get to things quickly. And, uh, and so that's the crisis zone. And then the yellow zone is where things are just a little off. And so you're going to make adjustments in their treatment and offer them the best appropriate care that you can. And then lastly, the green zone is when things are kind of stable for the patient. And at that point, you want to kind of be working on, uh, you know, uh, building a flourishing life. You know, how can they improve their relationships and their work and, and better their health even? So you want to think about how can the person flourish more? And so you want to think about where do these patients fall on this kind of traffic light continuum and triage them to the appropriate level of care that they need. All right, so next I'm going to talk about the opioid crisis. Uh, Nora Volkow uh, is the director of NIDA, and uh, you're going to hear a little bit about her explanation about how this happened to us. So let me click on her video here. Contrary to what we had believed in the past, that if you had pain, you wouldn't become addicted, now through animal models and careful follow-up of clinical uh, data, we're finding out that the, the notion of having a drug that can remove something that's very aversive, like if you have intense, intense pain and you take or they inject you an opioid and it disappears, that is extraordinary reinforcing. So the, your brain immediately learns not just that the drug may create you have this great sense of well-being, but at the same time, the drug has the capacity of getting you out of a very, very stressful state of mind, which is the way that you perceive emotionally, you perceive intense pain. And those two aspects contribute to make actually these uh, medications that we use for pain potentially uh, highly addictive. Okay. So along those lines, another thing that happened with the opioid epidemic is that our standards of pain treatment changed dramatically around the late 1990s. And uh, you know, what happened is that we had developed this concept of the fifth vital sign. So the normal vital signs are blood pressure and pulse and respiration and temperature. But it, it became some, some of the pain specialists said, you know, we need to pay closer attention to pain. And so they started to say, well, rating pain on a scale of one to 10 is a vital sign. And JCO, the Joint Commission, which is a federal government uh, overseeing of hospitals and physicians, kind of raised the standards of care for pain and said, we really need to address this more completely. And so, uh, and they also kind of de-emphasized the addictive potential of opiates. And that combination really led to this out of control, uh, you know, use of medications for pain and people, you know, getting into an addictive process. And so uh, I don't know what the final outcome of this, I couldn't find the, the end result of this lawsuit, uh, but, uh, you know, four, four cities in West Virginia actually uh, had a, a suit against the Joint Commission. And then I, another thing I want to talk about is that this can affect anybody in any walk of life. And so here's a, an article from, uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine about a medical student from the University of California, San Francisco. And so this guy uh, was treated in an emergency room and uh, he was given pain medication, opiate pain medication, but he failed to tell the provider that he had an addiction problem in the past. And if he would have just told them, he would be alive today. So that's the kind of the opinion that was expressed in this article. And so here, here's kind of, this is a wordy slide, but the story basically is that this guy in college uh, um, you know, ha had a, an injury and was treated with pain medication and developed an addiction and he went through several treatments and rehabilitation and he was on Suboxone for a brief period. And then he was abstinent for six years. And then while he was in medical school, he had a motorcycle accident and uh, he went to the ER and they gave him pain medication and he didn't tell the provider, you know, look, I've got a problem with substances. Please don't give me anything that's gonna cause me trouble. And so he, he used the prescription 
and uh, his behavior became erratic and it came to the attention of his faculty coach. And they talked to him and he denied substance use and he wasn't depressed and he wasn't suicidal and he passed his exam that he was taking, but he overdosed on heroin. And so you can really see this can happen to the most sophisticated people and you know the most impoverished people. So it, it really affects all walks of life. So next I'm gonna talk about marijuana and CBD and chronic pain and pain and addiction. So CBD is probably harmless, but it, it, my experience with CBD in the pain clinic here at WVU is that it's really largely ineffective for pain. And the other risk that it poses is when people with addictions, they can get positive drug screens uh, for THC on their drug screens because it's not you know, carefully regulated what's in the CBD. And then also marijuana poses some problems in, in itself when people are using that for pain. So first of all, it can cause a cannabis use disorder where the, the marijuana use gets out of control. Uh, and also psychiatric disorders are, are common. You can, people can develop psychosis and schizophrenia you know, that may have a predisposition to developing that problem. And major depression is a common co-occurrence. And then lastly, marijuana can be a gateway to other drug use. You know, what happens is when someone is using marijuana, they're obtaining it from a dealer of some kind. And that dealer might likely not be just dealing marijuana, but dealing all kinds of other substances. And so they're, and they're in a culture where people are using all kinds of things. So it really can be a gateway to using harder drugs and getting out of control more and more. On the other side of the coin, uh, marijuana can be helpful for neuropathic pain. And so that's a, a unique property of marijuana that's nice about it, uh, but it does pose risks. So I, I, I just don't, I don't want to paint a rosy picture alone about marijuana. All right, so here's some thorny issues. First of all, untreated pain can jeopardize recovery. So when someone's suffering with pain, uh, they're more likely to slip into substance use. So you have to address their discomfort. Uh, and uh, also opioid status post-surgery can trigger an addiction relapse. So we have to be careful about the treatment of pain after somebody has surgery. And then we talked about malingering and exaggerating pain to get medication. And you all know about diversion, abuse, and trafficking of opioids. And then pseudo addiction. I don't know if you guys have heard that term before, but pseudo addiction is when somebody is seeking more pain medication but it's really because their pain is not adequately treated. It's not because they have a, a substance use problem and they're, they're out of control with the substance use and the intoxicating effects of substances. So it's kind of a slippery slope, uh, you know, that pseudo addiction process. And then with opiate medications, as you push up the dose of an opiate, uh, you can get to something called hyperalgesia. And what hyperalgesia is, is that the the, the brain gets kind of sensitive to painful stimuli. It's called central sensitization. And so the slightest little discomfort is an intense and painful experience as the pain, as the, the brain gets more and more sensitive to discomfort. And so what happens is the brain kind of practices what it, the, the things that it's doing. It gets better at what it does. And so if there's pain, if there's pain sensations over a period of time, the part of the brain that's occupied, uh, devoted to pain processing and pain sensation becomes larger and larger. And so you get that sensitization, that central sensitization. And then also uh, withdrawal hyperalgesia can happen. So when a patient is coming off of an opioid pain medication, the withdrawal can lead to pain. And then another thorny issue that I wanna talk about is online clinician reviews. So as a physician, there are websites, health grades, and there's a whole bunch of websites where the, your general clientele will uh, rate uh, the quality of care that they receive. And so people with addictions and pain are a unique population that may be unsatisfied with the care that they're receiving because they may be seeking you know, a, a rewarding, an addiction rewarding medication 
uh, when actually uh, you're trying to provide them appropriate medical care and give them the treatment that they need. And so you can get some pretty lousy online reviews. And here's an example. So here's a patient who is seeking ketamine who's currently prescribed benzos, opiates, and stimulants by another provider. And she just slammed me. And I, I knew it was her because I recognized the language she used in the, in the, in the online review. It was the same kind of stuff that she said to me in person. So uh, I you know, was able to recognize who it was. And uh, you know, I, I thought differently about what her troubles were than she did. And I recommended what I thought was appropriate and she was just not satisfied. But she went a further step to really slam me in an online review. And so it's just kind of the nature of these uh, reviews that uh, you know, people come to healthcare maybe thinking that they should get what they want, but actually what you really wanna provide is the medical care that they need. And it, it can be different between what they want and what they need. It's an interesting concept there. All right, so next I'm gonna talk about integrative pain management. And so this is the kind of the gold standard of care of chronic pain. And so we're not just offering medications, there's pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches. And so what are the non-pharmacologic? We've got hot and cold packs and massage and physical therapy and biofeedback and acupuncture and electrical stimulation, chiropractic, nutrition, there's evidence that a, an anti-inflammatory diet can be helpful for pain, meditation and mindfulness, music therapy, exercise and movement therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy also should be included in that list. Uh, hypnosis, relaxing, relaxation techniques and deep breathing guided imagery, distancing and cognitive distraction, and psychiatric care. So uh, lots, of, lots of different techniques that are being used. And then also we've got pharmacologic approaches. So aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, opioids, which of course we're aware of, uh, tricyclic antidepressants and, and serotonin norepinephrine, norepinephrine read uptake inhibitors, uh, which are helpful for neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia, any convulsants, uh, which it can also be helpful for neuropathic pain like uh, Tegretol is used for trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, gabapentinoids, which are used for neuropathic pain. Steroids, uh, pept peptides like capsaicin, which is a topical treatment. Uh, marijuana, we already talked about, injections and pain pumps. So there's lots of injections. We've got nerve blocks and ganglion blocks and uh, trigger point injections, so lots of different kinds of injections that are used. So you're getting a sense of what I'm talking about here is that it's really a multimodal approach to pain that's the gold standard of treatment. And so I know in some communities it may be harder to offer the full spectrum of, of pain treatment modalities, but maybe the community can really think about, you know, what can we offer for these patients to not just, uh, you know, kind of go to that opiate medication as a way of treating somebody, especially somebody with pain and addiction where they need other treatments of their pain. So how do you rate pain? Well, at the Center for Integrative Pain Management, we rate pain with four elements. Uh, how does the pain affect your usual activity? How does it affect your sleep? Uh, how does it affect your mood? And how does it affect your stress? And so we use that to, to rate their pain and get an overall pain rating score. And then for patients who have needed opiates, you know, their pain is severe enough, they've failed other treatments of, of uh, chronic pain. Uh, there, there is a population of patients that we treat in what's called the high-risk pain clinic here at WVU. And uh, it's really treating people who have chronic pain that's not being adequately treated by other modalities, but there's also a risk of addiction or an addiction process going on. And so one of the natures of this clinic is that it's, it's, it's in the Center for Integrated Pain Management. So we don't take people who are in an acute addictive phase of, of their addiction process. So if somebody's actively using, we don't have the means to treat them acutely for addiction. 
So we really try to get people who have 90 days of sobriety or, you know, say it's a cancer patient who uses a little bit of marijuana. We may say, look, you know, if we're going to treat you in this clinic, the marijuana has got to stop. And if, and if they don't feel they're going to be able to stop, then it'd be more appropriate to treat them in an, in an addiction setting. Uh, but so anyway, you know, we're really looking at abstinence other than uh, the, the, the suboxone or buprenorphine, which we use in this clinic. And so other reasons to be in this clinic, running out of opioid medications early, failed pill counts, uh, severe psychiatric illness like depression or anxiety. So when people have severe psychopathology, they may be trying to ameliorate their psychological distress. You remember that total pain. So they may be trying to ameliorate that psychological dysphoria or anxiety uh, with medication. And so that can be a reason to be in the high-risk pain clinic. And then failed drug screens also can be a, a reason. So with Suboxone, it's actually a potent analgesic. So uh, uh, you may have heard that buprenorphine is a partial mu receptor agonist, but it's not a, not a partially effective medication. It's actually a very potent analgesic. And so this table is something called the morphine equivalents. And so you can compare different opiate medications uh, to morphine to see how potent they are. And so if you look at morphine at the top there, and the middle column is the oral uh, dosage. And so 30 milligrams of morphine, and then you look down to the third from the bottom, is equivalent to 0.3 milligrams of oral buprenorphine. And so you think of the usual doses that we use, like 8 or 16 milligrams of suboxone. So that much buprenorphine. So this is 0.3 milligrams, 30 milligrams of morphine. So the, the doses that we use for addiction tend to be much higher than you might need for analgesia uh, for somebody with chronic pain. And then also in the last column there, it shows the duration of effect. And so buprenorphine has a four to six hour duration uh, and so, uh, you know, when patients take buprenorphine for addiction, they may take it once a day. But if they're going to get good analgesic effect, they should be taking it at least twice a day, maybe three times a day, and postoperatively, you know, every four to six hours. So how do we use Suboxone in a high-risk pain clinic? So first of all, like I said, it's a high potency for analgesia. So in somebody who's not actively using opioids, we'd probably just start at one milligram twice a day. So just a two milligram film, cut it in half and take a half a film twice a day. And people get to higher doses, but some people do beautifully on just a, a very low dose. And then also uh, buprenorphine has a sealing effect, which makes it a safer opiate. So uh, what happens with buprenorphine is that it kind of saturates the receptors, but because it's a partial agonist, it can't, it can't suppress breathing to the same degree that a, a regular mu opiate agonist medication can. And so it has kind of a safety profile to it, a sealing effect. And also that sealing effect may affect analgesia at higher doses. So I think if you get up to 16 milligrams or more, you're kind of plateauing at the amount of analgesia that you'll get. And then constipation is a common side effect. So when you're treating constipation, you want to address it uh, above or below or both. And so above is like stool softeners and below, you want to stimulate the bowel. So like Senna oil or Senecot S stimulates the bowel and it gets the, the constipation loosened up that way. And then activity level is critical in measuring pain relief. So if somebody's lying in bed all day because they're in so much pain, that's a really terrible sign. Whereas if somebody's able to get themselves going and have some activity, that, that's what we're really looking for is quality of life. And so uh, you know, if we, we want to reduce the pain as much as possible, and we want to enhance the quality of life as much as possible. And then also, uh, so with the high-risk pain clinic, we use the multidisciplinary approach and the multimodal care. And we use things that don't engage addiction systems. And we do use analgesic adjuvants. So patients may get the other medications uh, for pain besides Suboxone. 
And, and like I said, low dose suboxone is often adequate. And one thing about insurance coverage is you need to be able to make a diagnosis of opiate use disorder in order to, uh, to get insurance coverage for the suboxone. And that may change because the literature is getting very, very strong uh, about suboxone for analgesia. And so uh, I, I, I imagine that it's going to get easier and easier to treat people strictly for pain with suboxone uh, and not have to have somebody with an opiate use disorder. But that's the way things stand right now. So the next thing I want to talk about is how patients can help themselves with chronic pain. And so we talked about all the multimodal approach that we use to help patients, but what can patients do for themselves? And this kind of grows out of the chiropractic model of pain relief. In, in chiropractic, they talk about patients being active participants in their health care what, what, rather than passive recipients of health care. And so uh, th this is really what's important. To, I think when someone becomes an active participant, their, their treatment goes better and the, and the quality of life improves more. And I think that goes for addictions as well as, uh, as chronic pain. So one thing that happens with chronic pain patients is they kind of have no idea how to help themselves and they may feel helpless and hopeless. And the general public and even the medical profession, you know, they think the only way to treat pain is through medication and injections and surgery and pain pumps and stimulators and chiropractic approaches and massage and acupuncture and physical therapy, and even sometimes use avoidance of the area that's affected. But so I'm going to list 12 things that patients can do for themselves. So the first thing is expectation management and realistic goal setting. And so when patients have unrealistic kind of expectations about what's going to happen with the pain, uh, it really can make it get out of control. It makes it much more unbearable. So they have to kind of shape their expectations. You want to improve things, but maybe don't expect total relief of pain or total improvement of functional capacities. And so you have to have kind of a realistic goal setting. And then also differentiating good pain from bad pain. So good pain is like the pain that someone gets from fitness uh, kind of activities or you know, anything that has a silver lining in the pain. Whereas bad pain is really about pathology. And so uh, you know, a patient needs to recognize, does this pain have a silver lining in it or is it just you know, pathology and that's it? And then lifestyle is important. So I talked about diet, the anti-inflammatory diet. Movement is helpful. So a lot of times patients think, you know, I'm going to wait till the pain goes away and then I'll start moving. But actually it's helpful to have some movement uh, that tends to improve pain at whatever you're able to do. And you have to pace yourself and be reasonable about what you're able to do. Uh, but some movement can be helpful. And then restorative sleep is important and your mindset is important. So having conditional optimism and a growth mindset, and even a stubborn hope. And then I, the last thing about lifestyle, I, I think a self-actualization lifestyle is really the ideal lifestyle. And so if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, you know, that lead to people self-actualizing, if you can make your lifestyle kind of fit those, those needs and address those needs, that's the kind of the healthiest lifestyle you can have. And then we talked about catastrophic thinking. So, you know, people get that harm alarm going and think something terrible is happening. And so they really need to learn to challenge their catastrophic thinking. And they learn that from cognitive behavioral therapy and chronic pain. Uh, but uh, once they learn that, they can do that for themselves. And we talked about pacing activities, so that's important. And then mental toughness is a good quality to develop. And so like in the military, they get very extreme about mental toughness and pain. And they kind of say pain is weakness leaving the body or feed the courage wolf and starve the fear wolf. But really what mental toughness is about is about cultivating great self-talk and visualization, you know, visualizing positive outcomes, uh, you know, that, that can make you mentally tough. And then stress recovery can be helpful. So developing unwinding routines, uh, you know, stress recovery is the new fitness. 
So you think of like athletics and uh, exercise, you've got aerobic exercise and strength training, and flexibility, but actually recovery is the new fitness. And so you want to have periods of stress, but you want to have also healthy periods of unwinding. And then meditation and mindfulness is helpful. I, I'm sure you guys have heard of mindfulness med meditation. And th that, of course, is helpful for addictions. It's also helpful uh, for chronic pain. And yoga can be helpful for chronic pain. Relaxation techniques. Uh, you've got the progressive muscle relaxation where someone tenses up the different muscle groups in their body and relaxes them systematically through the body. And 448 breathing. This is a concept developed by uh, Weil. What's his Andrew Weil, the integrated pain, integrative medicine specialist. He says, uh, breathe into your nose for a count of four, hold for a count of four, and then push out for a count of eight. And so you're breathing out for a count of eight, and that makes you automatically take a deeper breath in. And so I think when people think of deep breathing, they think I got to breathe in and gasp in for a real deep breath. But actually, the key is to push more air out. And that makes you automatically take a deeper breath in and really calms down the nervous system. So with breath therapy, you get to that kind of autonomic nervous system. So you have that fight and flight nervous system. And then the vagal tone is kind of the opposite of that. You know, like after you eat, how relaxed you feel after you eat. And so breath therapy is a way that we have to naturally trigger ourselves from going from that stress kind of autonomic nervous system to a calm, uh, you know, vagal tone. And then self-hypnosis can be helpful. So uh, I don't know if you guys know who Milton Erickson is. He's a very famous hypnotherapist who had polio, and he learned to treat his own chronic pain uh, through hypnosis. And really the best way to learn hypnosis is through experience. So uh, people can learn this experientially. And uh, you know, there's formal hypnosis and you know, ways of, of helping people uh, get anesthesia. But really the key to it is to dissociate away from the pain. So they kind of separate themselves from the pain. And so in some ways, the pain is asleep while the rest of the mind is awake. And uh, so people can do that in all kinds of settings. And it's really a skill that you can learn uh, with someone who knows about hypnosis. And if you're interested in hypnosis, just a caveat, I, I, I would remind you that uh, it's probably best to do it with a supervisor who knows about it rather than just exploring it on your own because uh, it can be a powerful technique and you might get caught up in something that maybe isn't so positive. So you want to you wanna have some supervision when you learn about hypnosis to, le to learn how to do it in a safe way. And then distress tolerance. So um, distress tolerance, basically when some patients with chronic pain feel like their whole life is so unbearable, it requires anesthesia. And often that grows out of adverse childhood experiences or psychiatric disorders. And so distress tolerance is the ability to kind of get to tolerate emotions that are negative in a healthy way. And so one thing that helps is not resisting distress. You know, not not resisting the the suffering, or, and so the opposite of that is softening into it. You know, that you soften into the pain, and so uh, if people can learn to do that, that can help with psychological distress, and it can help with physical distress. And then even sometimes thinking this too shall pass, or detaching from the discomfort, and then also being inoculated by the stress of the experience. Mm -hmm. So people think that stressful experiences are terrible for you, but they do make you tougher. And so uh, you know, it's like an inoculation, like an immunization. You have something difficult happen, it does make you more resilient. And then we talked about differentiating good pain from bad pain. And then also healthy activities and hobbies or employment and education. So that builds self-esteem, uh, it makes life richer and fuller, and it also fends off idle time and boredom. And so patients often talk about being bored. I see that a lot in my addictions patients, and patients with chronic pain, they feel that way too. And when they feel bored, they just kind of sit around and, and they're suffering. And so getting involved in activities can help 
Uh, and people th who are bored think, you know, entertainment is what I need if I'm bored. But actually, the best antidote to boredom is goals. And when somebody has a goal, they've got something to strive for every day. They got something to think about and work on and plan and, and strategize. And so making goals is really the key to, to dealing with boredom. And then acceptance. So we talked about acceptance and commitment therapy. And so acceptance kind of allows somebody to not be so defensive in their situation and that they have kind of a compassion for themselves and healing becomes possible with acceptance. And I like what Lisa Paul said. Lisa Paul was a therapist here at WVU. Uh, she, she's, not, she's not here any longer, but she said that just like someone falls in love, they can fall into acceptance. And so acceptance can be helpful. So those are all the things that uh, people can do for themselves to help with chronic pain. And it's a, it's a lot of things really, you know, that uh, it empowers them to feel like they can take some steps to help themselves and be active in their healthcare and not just passive recipients. And then also there's ways that patients can help themselves achieve and maintain abstinence. So probably the most important thing is motivation. And so uh, if, you, if you look at the reasons why people stop using substances, consequences, the escalating consequences is the most important reason. And so if you can get patients to reflect on, you know, this is kind of, there's a lot of room for improvement. I've, I've done some things here that uh, could be improved. You know, if they can see their consequences and play the tape through or think through the drink, you know, that helps them stay sober. And then surrendering. So this, that life doesn't work for me. You know, uh, just kind of accepting, hey, that, that, that's not an option any longer. I tried that, it didn't work. And then preparing for high risk situations for relapse. So that comes from the cognitive approach to, to addictions. But patients can learn to do that for themselves. And once they learn that from a therapist, they can do it for themselves. And then social group reconstruction is so important. So if you think about all the phone numbers that somebody has in their, in their, uh, in their cell phone, if they get the numbers out of people that are drug dealers and people who they use with, you know, that can be a big boost to helping them maintain recovery. And so social group reconstruction is super important. And then also a good recovery environment. So are you in an environment where there's lots of people who use substances or trigger you to use substances? And so creating a good recovery environment is a, an avenue that patients can take to improve their chances of, of staying sober. And then establishing personal and family security. So I think particularly of drug dealers who struggle with this the most, you know, that it's hard to have a secure sense of home when people want to rob you and take your, the drugs that you have and threaten you. And so uh, having a personal and family security is so important. And then stress recovery, we talked about unwinding routines, distress tolerance, healthy activities and hobbies. And then also a radical shift in identity. So when, when a patient thinks of themselves as a pothead, you know, that kind of reinforces the behavior to use marijuana or you know, any kind of a stunted identity that kind of reinforces substance use as a problem. And so if patients can shift that identity to a strong and distinctive identity, uh, that can really change how they how they behave. And then lastly, purpose. So living in a manner in alignment with one's values, that can be really helpful. All right, so what about recovery? So the modern thinking about addictions recovery, this comes from uh, the Betty Ford Clinic. They said that recovery has three components, abstinence, well-being, and giving back. And so uh, chronic pain recovery is really similar. It's really the self-management of pain, well-being and giving back. And so those kind of recoveries actually do something to the brain called self-directed neuroplasticity. And so what I mean by that is the brain gets good at what it practices. And so if you're practicing recovery, you know, if you're practicing abstinence and self-management of pain and well-being and giving back, the brain gets good at that, and it actually competes out uh, the, un the unhealthy stuff because there's always so much cortical real estate 
And so if the brain is getting more and more involved in healthy functioning, it competes away the pathological stuff out of disuse. And so Norman Doidge is the real expert on neuroplasticity of the brain. But I think it really explains, you know, why recovery is so, you know, from a neuroscience standpoint, how does recovery work? And I think that really explains kind of what's going on there. And so the interesting thing about chronic pain recovery, you know, ordinarily with chronic pain, we just put the fire out. You know, you, somebody has pain, you give them a treatment for it. But when you're doing recovery, you're actually governing the fire itself because you're changing what the brain is focusing on and what it's practicing. All right, so what are the future directions? So uh, one thing that we might be able to do, you know, if you think about natural processes uh, in the brain and the body where there's natural experiences of pain, you know, maybe we've evolved ways of dealing with pain uh, naturally. And so the most painful experience that people probably naturally have is labor and delivery. And so what are the, what's going on in that situation? So the, the body releases oxytocin and prolactin and relaxin and endorphins. And we know endorphins are opiates and they can be helpful for pain. But what about oxytocin, prolactin and relaxin? Maybe they could play a role you know, and helping to relieve pain. And then virtual reality. So uh, virtual reality is becoming more and more part of psychological treatments. Uh, they have treatments for PTSD and phobias using virtual reality. And maybe we'll be able to create analgesia through suggestion with virtual reality. And then neuromodulation. So there's something called focused ultrasound where they can target an area of the brain uh, to to reduce the activity of that brain area or increase the activity of that brain area. And so if you think about uh, the neuroscience of, of pain, that maybe we could help to affect the emotional and, and the sensory experience of pain through neuromodulation. And then transcranial magnetic stimulation and deep brain stimulation, all these are ways of modulating pain experience. And then also interventional pain medicine. So the invasive procedures, implantable devices. So we have like spinal cord stimulators and devices, pain pumps, devices like that. But there's a lot of room for development in that area to come up with implantable devices and procedures that can be helpful. And then probably the most important thing in my mind is bringing medically hospitalized patients into recovery. So a lot of times patients are in the hospital, they have pain, the addiction may not even be identified in that patient. And so they never really get engaged in treatment. And so we really have to identify these people and who are the patients who have chronic pain and addiction or, or even acute pain and addiction and how can we get them into the appropriate treatment that they need? And so I think uh, you know, engagement is super important. And then the future of pain management is linked both to science and education. And so, uh, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of growth there as we focus more and more on this. So some con conclusions. We need tools and insights to improve the ability to navigate the world living with pain and addiction. And so pain is both sensory and emotional. And maybe the most simple way of looking at this is to say, if we fix the process, you solve the problem. And so how can we get the process of the sensory and emotional experience of pain. And in the same way, you know, addiction is about loss of control mostly. And so how do we fix the process and solve that problem? And so maybe one way to do it is through recovery, a multimodal approach. So, uh, of course you have to address psychiatric and medical comorbidities. And the, the safe and effective pain care for patients with a substance use disorder benefits the recovery process. So we talked about untreated pain uh, can lead to more addiction problems. And so we have to be able to address this appropriately. And ideally what we want to do is safely reduce pain while improving function. And so it's, it's function is a real measure of how well someone is doing with their pain situation. And so the best quality of life possible is what we're after given the reality of the clinical situation.
So just a closing thought. Some people wear the weight of their suffering lightly. Just a nice, beautiful thought about people who deal with the, the seriousness of pain. And here's my references. All right, so any questions or, or thoughts? You can unmute or is there a chat function here, Laura, that they can? Yeah, people can either put things in the chat. I've been monitoring the chat and uh, there's nothing in there at the moment uh, or just unmute and uh, certainly make a comment or ask any kinds of questions. I particularly like that idea of um, that recovery can ocu occupy more real estate in our brains than all of the negativity or the, the pain or the suffering. Um, and if, if, we, if we help people bolster um, those activities, they will prevail. Yeah, it's like a, a competition for cortical real estate. Right. <laughs> Any thoughts or comments or questions? I hope that was helpful. This is, this is a serious matter that we're facing in our country. I you know the U.S. really kind of got way out of control compared to the rest of the world, you know, with prescribing opiates. And so we, we've got to think deeply about how to, what the culture should be around treating pain and addiction. And the, the quote that I always like is that um, pain is part of life, but suffering is optional and to help people not have to be in a place of, of suffering um, and to increase functionality, as you said, is, is really important piece. Did the, did the numbers sound right to you guys that uh, you know thirty percent of your patients to sixty percent of your addiction patients have pain? Does that seem like what you're seeing, or what do you guys think? Uh, so someone just posted something. Uh, a thought I was having is that inpatient treatment centers for substance use disorders are not adequately addressing pain, and it makes some people hesitant to even go into treatment. That's a big issue. So we know that untreated pain is just going to perpetuate addiction. So they have to find a way. Uh, maybe that's going to require some outreach to educate the, the, that treatment provider or that uh, group you know, about uh, appropriate medical care for people with pain and addiction. And, and what I see already with uh, medical marijuana coming online in our state is patients wanting to pursue that as an avenue for, for treating pain when in fact they have, um, you know, a substance use disorder diagnosis. And so educating providers that, you know, it's contraindicated if someone has a substance use di disorder diagnosis typically uh, to treat pain with uh, cannabis. Yeah, so uh, I know as it becomes legalized, people become more and more interested in using it to, to treat pain. Uh, but I think it poses a lot of risks for people, even those who don't yet have an addictive disorder, you know, that you're opening up a, a vulnerability for some people. That's going to, that may be a big problem that we see. So, so someone posted, um, we are at the VA, uh, we at the VA address chronic pain management in whole health programming and in our pain clinic and residential treatment programs. And we certainly see a correlation, uh, but you know, a co-occurring, a co-occurrence co of substance use disorder uh, with chronic pain. Yeah, so the, the whole person is kind of the key to what's going on with pain management, this multimodal and pain treatment, you know, thinking about we're treating the whole person and not just a site that's uh, affected by pain. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the psychological part of the person and the social part of the person, the physical part of the person, you're addressing everything. Do you see, I know there was a resurgence or a, an emergence of this at one point. What are you seeing with misuse of uh, Neurontin uh, currently in, as a you know, it, obviously it's a medication that gets prescribed for pain, but also uh, it has potential for misuse. Yeah, so we do pill counts and drug screens and, uh, you know, whenever somebody, if there's aberrant behavior around the medication that's being prescribed, 
say that's an individual who doesn't have an addictive disorder but starts to demonstrate those behaviors. If that's the kind of person that may fall into the high risk pain clinic if we're starting to show some concerning behaviors. So, uh, you yeah, know, they do drug screens and pill counts. Uh, and there's a question, kind of a diagnostic question. After what period of time is pain considered chronic pain? Three to six months. Three to six months, okay. And um, there's a rehabilitation counselor who made a comment. So um, really enjoyed you addressing the psychosocial aspects and other therapeutic avenues that could be utilized in order to treat chronic pain and substance use disorder. So that, again, that whole person approach. Yeah, so people forget that we've become so focused in this world on pharmacologic treatments of medical issues. And uh, we're missing the boat with what you can really offer people by focusing just on biology. Um, and just a reminder, uh, PDFs, the PDFs of most of the presentations will be posted to uh, the website by the end of the day and the videos hopefully will be up there by the end of the week if somebody missed something or wanted to rewatch something. Oh, there are a few more comments coming in. Um, I appreciate your dedication to the study of chronic pain in relation to active recovery. Erasing the pain immediately is not always an option. Yeah, so that's definitely true. You know, realistic expectations about what's going to happen as far as total pain relief or functional capacities, you know, they, they have to kind of help them shape kind of sensible expectations. And they'll, they'll be more satisfied with the result if they don't have kind of unrealistic expectations about what's possible. And there was a comment about, I don't know if you've heard of this um, treatment, treatments that work uh, managing chronic pain by John Otis is a fantastic program we use at the VA. I'm not familiar with that. It defines acute and it, it defines acute versus chronic pain, it says. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Herschler. We appreciate you being here today. And thank you everyone for attending the 32nd annual uh, ATI um, and for making it uh, interactive and, and positive. So appreciate all the work you guys do with the people you do it with. Absolutely. And don't forget about self-care. Uh, taking care of yourself is very important as well. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care, everybody. See ya.